Hey, Lauren. Hey, Nancy. Hey, so Sheen is in Alaska, away again. Sheen's away, so we're taking over again. Again, here we are. I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I was actually wanted to ask you, what if we ever find aliens, what do you think they're going to look like? <laughs> like E.T.? Yeah, I mean, well, do you no, think I mean, they'll, do they'll, like, yeah, think do you they'll, think look, they'll like, look like E.T. or do they think they'll be different? I feel like they'll look like E.T. I mean, they'll probably not look anything like anything, but I think I like to think they're going to look like cute, like E.T. <laughs> Like maybe we'd be able to communicate with them yeah. in some way. I yeah. feel like what do you think? I feel like they would just be so weird we wouldn't even know what they were. Right. We think they're like a plant or something. Right. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, very and it could interesting. Be way more sophisticated than us. Hmm. Hi, and welcome to the American Geophysical Union's podcast about the scientists and the methods behind the science. These are the stories you won't read in a manuscript or hear at a lecture. I'm Nancy Bompy. And I'm Lauren LaPuma. And this is Third Pod from the Sun, Centennial Edition. Woo. Yeah, so aliens. Aliens. I mean, it is pretty crazy to think about what aliens might look like, but we have pretty, some pretty crazy, you know, creatures here on Earth. Like, have you ever seen those, you know, like on planet Earth when they go down to the bottom of the... The ocean. And they're like the wacky, anglerfish. Totally mm-hmm. wacky totally and like wacky. like white wormy things. Yeah. They're so unimaginable. And well, actually, that's kind of what we're going to talk about today in this episode, Nance. Oh, cool. So yeah, recently our other producer, Josh Spizer, he and I talked with a world-renowned oceanographer, Kathy Crane, and she has seen some of the most bizarre creatures in the world. Hey, Josh. Hi, guys. So Kathy was a pioneer in the field of oceanography. She was one of the first scientists to hypothesize and then by going down to the bottom of the ocean in some of the earliest deep ocean submersibles, she discovered the existence of hydrothermal vents and many of the strange creatures that make their home in this weird, improbable, and difficult environment. And the discovery of hydrothermal vents showed that life can survive in some of the harshest environments on Earth. And it really changed how scientists thought about the kinds of life forms that can exist here. And so Lauren and I talked with Kathy and heard her great and very unique story about how this discovery came about. Well, I was, became interested in uh, becoming an oceanographer when I was really oh, maybe 10 years old or so. I wanted to be a, an oceanographer or an astronaut. Ignition. Basically, I wanted to just explore the world. I graduated from college in 1973 and uh, nobody was being uh, no women allowed in the astronaut program without those days I graduated from geology and with a minor in German I loved languages and so so I, I applied to Scripps Institution of Oceanography I was a student at Oregon State University and was accepted by Scripps Institution of Oceanography, much to my amazement. <laughs> and uh, but I couldn't couldn't become an astronaut. So at this point, uh, we should probably explain what hydrothermal vents are for those <laughs> people who do not know. <laughs> yeah, we should. So hydrothermal vents are essentially where cracks in Earth's crust at the very bottom of the ocean. So when there's a crack in the crust, when two tectonic plates are moving past each other, magma can rise up to the bottom of the ocean, essentially, and heat the really cold seawater there. This brings a lot of nutrients to the water, and the water gets so hot, and as it moves and interacts with even more cold seawater, it creates this hydrothermal circulation. And so lots of different kinds of life can actually uh, live down there at the bottom of the ocean. Hmm. Well, that's a pretty straightforward explanation for something that's pretty complex. But before Kathy's work, uh, the idea of hydrothermal vents had never actually been definitively proven. To me, it seemed pretty simple. I mean, you've got volcanoes down there. We knew that. You, they were all over the seafloor or, or at some point. Uh, the point was people didn't know if they were active. It's just like calling Mount Hood dormant. Well, someday it's going to go off again. <laughs> you know, things like this people would say because they'd never seen it. You have water and you have volcanoes. So you've got hot water, for goodness sakes. I mean, <laughs> it's not so difficult to, well, for right now for people to conceive of it. But I, when I went to Scripps, I mean, it was a great place because then, well, For me, it was a great place, and all the people who applied there had to be real explorers at heart, adventurers to the unknown. And so we were kind of self-selected at the time. We didn't even have very many books about the ocean. I was thinking about a lot of different areas that I wanted to look at, and I said, I'm going to go to 
study volcanoes on the sea floor. And actually, in 1972, I went there in 1973. In 1972, over the Galapagos Spreading Center, there were temperature anomalies recorded by using this deep toe instrument, which was really a sonar system, and it made sound images of the sea floor. And but it also had thermometer strung down below and the scientists there actually recorded some some temperature anomalies in the order of like several thousandths of a degree, maybe a hundredth of a degree centigrade above background, which is turns out to be quite a bit in a deep ocean. And um, because it gets temperatures get absorbed pretty fast and you got super cold water anywhere anyway. So it's because it's at that depth, it's just, it stands out. Yeah, it's so. almost a freezing temperature at the bottom of the ocean uh, in freshwater. But mm-hmm. salt water, it freezes at a lower temperature. Mm-hmm. So, And that really intrigued me. And in fact, I mean, this wasn't the first time these things had been discovered. In the 1880s, a Russian ship, the Vityas, discovered super hot water at the bottom of the Red Sea. And then there were several vessels after that from uh, Sweden, from Germany, all going back to the Red Sea, discover these hot sea brines down there. It's a really contained area. So it's so been found before, but just hadn't reached really the American literature. Mm-hmm. And then other geologists had discovered by taking cores all across the um, East Pacific rise and such, really rich in, in iron ore and other ores that you normally find in volcanic sediments that have been mixed with waters on the land. So to them, it was a big evidence that some big thing was going on. on the so, I, you know, we weren't anywhere near the first, but near the first to put these various discoveries together. This engineer and I, who had been on the ship together, worked together a lot. So we just we decided and got permission to lower and enhance our temperature system on the get bring it much closer to the seafloor. We towed this instrument rather close, but this this uh, extension really helped us get hotter temperatures when when we were over places. And that uh, we went out oh several 1975 to the North Atlantic near Iceland to track these things and uh, to track, try to track them because we hadn't quite gotten to the, to the Mecca, you know, we hadn't gotten there yet. So we had a lot of uh, instrumentation designed towards that. We were going, going over a mid-ocean ridge that runs into Iceland. Iceland sits on mid-ocean ridge, it's super hot and erupts all the time. And, so we had some, also some difficulties with, uh, I remember I uh, was working, well, Marsha McNutt was on that cruise with me, Karen Wishner, so we had three women, I think. Anyway. It's a quorum. Was, <laughs> 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 yeah, so uh, I had managed to convince a physical oceanographer to give me some current meters to, to deploy onto the mid-ocean ridge to keep track of information in a stationary places so we could gather the, a larger picture time-wise over this rather than just a transient towing something through an area. So this, I just, just to show, this was not easy. We had a, a, a chief scientist, two chief scientists on board who were um, not believing in any, any of this rigmarole and they wanted to use these, these current meters in their own sedimentary studies and, you know, troughs and, you know, interesting things, but they were, we brought them on board to do this particular study to try to track hot springs from the mm-hmm. seafloor. And I remember being awakened one night. I never slept all night, but anyway, mm-hmm. uh, Marsha McNutt was standing over me, Kathy, Kathy, they're throwing your, your, your current meters over the side in their own area. So I went up there, and yeah, they had just tossed the last one off about, you know, several hundred miles away from where we were going to do this work. There's nothing I could do. Why? They just, why? why? Because these scientists are humans. Mm -hmm. They want what they wanted. I mean, this is not a glorified field. These are people out there competing with one another. Mm -hmm. They want to take tools, do their things. So um, by the time we got to Iceland, yeah, we got there after a huge storm, almost a hurricane, where we had to all stand in the back of the ship and tow this instrument in by hand. 
because of you know winches and couldn't use them anymore. And so by the time we got to Reykjavik, the chief scientist came to me, guy from Woods Hole, I won't say his name, but anyway, <laughs> uh, he said, uh, Kathy, you better change your thesis. You are never going to find hot springs on the seafloor. Boom. <laughs> so it made me more and more, yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> So that was 75. By 1976, there were some people at Oregon State who did believe in this, Jack Corliss and Jack Diamond and guys, and they, they had previously been at Scripps and were the ones who had studied the, uh, the chemistry, the, the sedimentary chemistry on the flanks of the East Pacific rise and had you know, figured out there must be something big going on there. So they actually managed to get some money f- to go back and check well, in the Galapagos, where we had had expeditions by the deep toe to map the place. And I was put in charge for the Scripps group. We went over the spots where Bob and David had found these temperature anomalies, and sure enough, with our, our enhanced... Uh, temperature systems, we were able to to discover that. And for the first time, we photographed clamshells. Mm-hmm. <laughs> clamshells, yeah, we figured out, I figured out, there were big clamshells. But at the time, our official chief scientist from Scripps was uh, Peter Lonsdale. He was not a believer in these hot springs mm-hmm. when we left. He was a real believer when we, when we came back, or when we arrived back in port in Panama. They weren't super hot at the time. We found a tenth of a degree at that time. So, but that was even like a hundred times more than, or a thousand times more than what we had discovered before. And we weren't really sure what the clam clam shells were there all about, but I knew that it was an easy place to spot the vent areas because they they stood out like snow against a sooty background or something, you know? So it was just like in your eyes. The side scan sonar was transmitting up the cable so we could really see where we were, um, faults and volcanoes and all these other things. It was all images by sound that we were looking at. So Spies was a genius as the head of the program. He was a, a genius inventor. And uh, so he would let his students attach almost anything to the basic instrument. Is what we call a Rube Goldberg machine. <laughs> After we had little sedimentologists with little whirring fans collecting stuff from the water, a biologist made a three-tiered closing net so it looked like a, you know, crocodile. <laughs> so you've got this Rube Goldberg machine, as you said. Right. You're towing it behind the ship with all these different, you know, tools attached to it. And you're watching on a video screen. Did you have a like a Archimedes moment, a Eureka moment when you saw something on the screen? You're like, aha. Well, um, I guess. Uh, I mean, all all the engineers, everyone was looking for temperatures rising on the signal, and so we noticed at the time. Oh my gosh, there's like white clam shells there, and so we know they're they're they correspond with temperature anomalies and. Uh, we weren't really sure, but I, I was pretty sure, of course. In fact, all of us. Uh, Peter Lonsdale became a convert at that time, and uh, the other folks on board were converts, I have to say. So I guess just by seeing this increased temperatures there, we knew it, we, were, we were on the mark. Mm-hmm. So that was a very, that uh, was really exciting. So when did the submersibles come in? My thesis advisor actually moved to England to be sort of the head of the Office of Naval Research, uh, foreign office in London for a year. So I had no real thesis advisor there. And uh, so I reached out to a Woods Hole geophysicist, um, Dick von Herzen, who did heat flow and things. And so he agreed to sort of uh, shepherd me and I he had been one of the chief scientists together. Well, he was he was put as he was on the second leg of the 1976 voyage, so we knew each other quite well. And I had all these photographs that we had taken of the Rift Valley, and I said, "Well, you know," he said, "Why don't you come to Woods Hole and let's make a big mosaic of all these photos?" 
they were nervous about the uh, Oregon State people mm -hmm. and about, I think, Dick von Herzen, because they had never worked with submersibles before. So they talked to Bob Ballard about doing this because he had spent a lot of time doing submersible work for his thesis off the coast of Maine. And they had done some stuff in the Mid-Atlantic Ridge earlier. Oh, and the Lulu, which is what we used as our support vessel, was really a giant pontoon boat. Uh, <laughs> and ran a run out of Woods Hole. Mm -hmm. And it held the Alvin, and it had some containers on the top, one for the science van, and, and then people slept down in the pontoons. They used to call it the, the biggest, uh, it was like a flush toilet in the ocean because all the water went whoosh through the pontoons and then out. So uh, that's what the scientists and the crew members called it. So what did you see? Well, it was just great um, going down through the waters and seeing all these yeah, from the very surface down, they had the lights on blinking and you would see all sorts of fish. Amazing life I'd never seen. And it turned out no biologist had ever seen them either. <laughs> but this is in the upper water column. So, um, yeah, when we had photographs of these things, sent them to biologists. In my, my area, that dive, 12 degrees seawater, which was like a spa for all these fish down there. It was very unusual, but you don't have fish living at the deep sea. Everyone knew that. How far down are you? We were about uh, 2,800 meters, I believe. Yeah. And uh, something like that, maybe off by 300. I have to look at my book again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we went right to uh, one of the clam bakes. And I realized then, we realized when people went there, like, okay, that was a great description. And when I sent the first people down, look for the clamshells. They'll guide you to the hot vents. So not, not really fully understanding that they were animal life that thrived off of the vents. We were seeing the dead shells because they, they were before sort of brownish and everything. If they, And then they were like, there were a lot of different animal forms, but we never saw the the tube worms until we took a traverse along the rift axis and they came across a, across a very hot hot spring with all of these worms. Can you tell us what they look like? Uh, it was like a we call it rose garden. I named it rose. I think I named it rose garden, but uh, it was um, they look like roses, so, pristine white stems that were part of the worm uh, and they were fixed hold fast onto onto the basalt rocks below them and at the top was a head that was scarlet red with looked like pink petals coming out which is where it got its all its nutrients and everything taking the chemistry off of the ocean water absolutely beautiful place and no one had seen these before no 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 nobody I remember uh, Emery had just taught me from the geographer, just taught me how to use his, uh, use a geographic camera, and I just happened to have in my porthole the most exquisite view of this whole row of tube worms. So, to the picture, I got a three page spread in the geographic. <laughs> he got like a small picture. He said, I don't believe it. I just trained you how to shoot this picture. I said, it wasn't me. You're all luck. there. It was like, <laughs> don't have much choice out of a you know, six inch wide portal what you're going to photograph. <laughs> so, uh, so absolutely beautiful stuff. And in fact, I may be mixing that with the next operation there because they're running in my mind now. So, yeah. But in 77, yes, we really had fantastic stuff. And so anyway, we, um, we were bringing these, these creatures back to the surface and have photographs. We called up to Woods Hole to the biologists and were saying, well, we've got all of these things. We, we don't know what they are. So what did it feel like for you when you went back to the Galapagos and you found the tube worms and you saw that the vents were real and there was life there and everything? Did you feel vindicated? You know, so many people had doubted you. What was this discovery like for you personally? The discovery was fantastic. Just, in fact, uh, my thesis advisor said, 
You're amazing, Kathy. I think you have the greatest intuition of anybody in my group. And here was this Navy commander telling me this. So, so I don't know. <laughs> well, it's like finding extraterrestrials in some ways, right? Yeah. They were, you know, to to us. And it was, I was just so pleased that it became a really fantastic discovery for biologists. Because there were no biologists out there when we discovered it. And... Uh, I think it was uh, Karen Wishner who was always went with us. She was one of the biologists who went everywhere to look for new things. A lot of the biologists had been trained to go back and back and back again to try to find more and more and more out. But I, I was always an, the kind of person, and I think the other people who went into oceanography at the time, we really were the people who wanted to go over the next wave, over the next mountain, you know, not stay in one place. So this episode has it all. It's like a, it's like a real, um, you know, crazy story. There's scientists sabotaging each other, <laughs> people, you know, coming up with these crazy tools to explore the ocean floor, and then, you know, finding these new species that they never saw before, like out of a sci-fi movie. It's like real intrigue. There is a lot of intrigue. <laughs> but actually, Nancy, if you like intrigue, you should wait for our next Centennial podcast episode because we're going to be talking about a top secret military base from the Cold War era that is buried beneath the Greenland ice sheet. Whoa. Yeah. It's that like sounds a, pretty sweet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like a James Bond movie. Ooh, <laughs> I'll definitely have to listen out for that. Well, I mean, I will because I'm like the host, so I, of course I will. <laughs> yep, you'll, you'll be hearing all about it. <laughs> all right, everyone. That's all from Third Pod from the Sun, Centennial Edition. Thanks so much to Josh for bringing us this story and, of course, to Kathy for sharing her work with us. And this podcast is also produced with help from Shane Hanlon, Olivia Ambrosio, Katie Brendel, and Liza Lester. And thanks to Colin Warren for producing this episode. We would love to hear your thoughts on this podcast. Please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. Um, and you can find new episodes wherever you get your podcasts. And, of course, at thirdpodfromthesun.com. All right. Thanks, everyone. And be on the lookout for more Centennial episodes to come. And as well as our regular episodes of this podcast, which drop in the beginning of the month. That's right. Thanks, and we'll see you next time. Bye.